Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we'll be continuing our series in Revelation by looking at Revelation chapter 9 verses 13 through 21. Revelation 9, 13 through 21. Here we'll be looking at the sixth trumpet judgment. While you're turning to Revelation 9, 13 through 21, remember, the trumpet judgments that are uh, spoken of in the book of Revelation are symbolic representations of God's wrath that will fall at the second coming of Christ. Keep in mind, in a literal sense, what's going to happen when Christ comes back? God's wrath is going to fall against lost mankind and against a fallen world. That will take place through the use of literal fire that comes down from heaven and consumes lost men and renovates the sinful world, purifying it for a sinless eternity. So that's literally what's going to take place. But here in these six trumpets, we can learn many truths about that time of God's wrath in a symbolic way. These trumpets, these trumpet judgments, are symbols that are given to us to teach us truths about that literal judgment by fire that's going to fall in the last days. Watch what's said in Revelation 9, verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded. Okay, here we have John now hearing the sixth angel blowing the trumpet, announcing God's wrath is about to fall in the sixth trumpet judgment. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet. Okay, John now hears a voice coming from the golden altar before the Lord. If you remember prior to this, we have seen where this golden altar is the incense altar. Upon this incense altar, the incense arose to heaven, picturing a pleasing uh, event taking place in God's sight where he's pleased with it, like with a, with a aroma that arises to heaven that's very pleasing. What is that incense that's rising to heaven? It's the prayers of God's people. We looked at this all in great detail in previous studies. So when John hears a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar, he's hearing the prayers of God's people. What are they praying for? Justice to be done. We've seen that also in previous lessons. So as God's people are praying for justice to be done on earth, as God's people are praying for lost mankind to face judgment for their sins, this is what's taking place. As God hears their prayer now, he then answers them by sending judgment upon the world for the sins of lost mankind. Watch what's said. Here's what the voice is saying. Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now keep in mind, we're going to see in just a minute that these angels are pictures of a demonic army, and we'll see this in just a minute just as we progress down through these verses, but it's important for us to understand these four angels that are bound in the great river Euphrates are pictures of demonic powers that have an appointed time for them to do what? To send judgment upon mankind. Now let me just explain this in a little bit more detail. Folks, when God's wrath falls upon lost mankind at Christ's second coming, we have to recognize the fact that this wrath is falling at least partially because of demonic activity through the ages. Now stop and think about it. Think about some of the things that demons have done throughout the ages that have brought lost mankind into the horrible condition they're in. First of all, the obvious one, Satan in the Garden of Eden. Do you know that if Satan had never been in the Garden of Eden, mankind would not have fallen? And if mankind would not have fallen, you would not have sin in, in the realm of mankind. You would not have lost men. You would not have God's wrath falling at all. But it's because of what demons, especially the demon known as Satan, it's especially what Satan did at the garden that caused this whole mess to start with. By the way, real quickly, what do I mean by a demon? A demon is another term for a fallen angel. Okay, Satan is a fallen angel. That's why we can call him a demon as well. 
Think about what other fallen angels have done throughout history. Do you know that whenever you have a man stand up and teach error, that's partially because of demonic activity? It's because of demons that we have, at least partially because of demons, that we have false teaching in the world, we have false religions in the world, we have a false uh, way of salvation being presented to the world. At least partially that's because of demon activities in the world. Why is it that men cannot clearly see the truth? Well, a part of it is because of their fallen nature, but a part of it is because of demonic influence in their life as well. So you have all these lost people hearing a false message and following it, not realizing what the truth is. Why is that? Partially it's because of demonic activity. Folks, throughout the ages you've had demons who are active in this world misleading men, leading men astray, causing men to remain in a lost state. That's a part of the work of demons. If it wasn't for the work of demons in this world, you would have no such thing as God's wrath falling. And that's the very point that's being brought out here. Why is, does God's wrath fall when Christ comes back? Partially it's because of what's taking place right here. It's because of demons that have been loosed into the world that have intervened in mankind, causing them to be lost and causing them to remain in a lost condition. Notice that they were prepared for an hour a day, a month and a year to slay the third part of men. God's in control of it all, folks. Anything they did as demons, any work that they accomplished, they did under the sovereign will of allowance of God, meaning God allowed them to do it. The best example I can give you of that is in Job 1 and 2. Remember when Job wanted to intervene in, I'm sorry, when Satan wanted to intervene in the life of Job? and cause some horrible thing to take place in Job's life, God had to allow him to do it first. Does this mean that God is the cause of sin or the author of sin? Absolutely not. But it does teach us that our Lord is in control. He's in absolute control of all things. And you can see these demons can work among men only at the times that God allows it to take place. What about this river Euphrates? The river Euphrates throughout the Bible is a picture of a beginning point. Now let me give you just a few of these and there's many, many of them. If you study when Euphrates is used in the Bible, it is, it, it is related or linked to the beginnings of many different things. Here's some of them. The beginning of mankind in Genesis 2 took place at the river Euphrates. The beginning of Israel in Genesis 15:18, The beginning of the search for the promised land in Deuteronomy 1-7. The beginning of man's responsibility to keep the law in Deuteronomy 11:24, 24. Uh, the beginning of Joshua as leader of Israel in Joshua 1-4. It goes on and on. If you study all the different times that the Euphrates has talked about, many of those times it's linked to some type of beginning. Something new is taking place. Why are these angels said to come from the river Euphrates? Folks, again, in a sense, that's be the beginning of God's wrath. It's only because of what the demons have done in the world that we have God's wrath taking place in the world. You can even see that clearly in Revelation 16, 12. Okay, let's go on in verse 16. Now, we switch from having our attention on the four angels being loosed out of the river Euphrates under the allowing will of God to work amongst men that will result in this wrath of God being necessary. It jumps from that to an army of horsemen. Watch. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, 1,000. And I heard the number of them. It seems as if, if we don't understand the symbolic nature of Revelation, it seems as if, as if Revelation 15 and Revelation 16 have no connection. 
It goes from saying the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, a year, for to slay the third part of men. And then it goes on and says, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, 200 million. And I heard the number of them. What's going on? What, did John suddenly get another new vision now of a bunch of horsemen where before he saw four angels? Folks, again, because this is a book of symbols, what's taking place is this. The symbol of the four angels bound in Euphrates that are then loosed is now transformed into a symbol of an army of horsemen. The horsemen are the angels. There were only four angels. Now John sees it morph into an army of 200,000 thousand. In other words, 200 million horsemen. Okay, why four angels? That's simply a symbolic representation to us of the fact that demonic workings among men takes place on all points of the globe, north, south, east, and west. There's not a place where demons don't work in this earth. There isn't a place where demons haven't worked to cause God's wrath to end up falling. <coughs> Excuse me. Now this number of horsemen. Why 200,000 thousand? Why? Well, first, why horsemen? It's a picture of an army. And you'll see again as we progress through uh, these next verses, you'll see the, these horsemen are a picture of a gigantic army that's going to battle. Do you know that what took place during the ages is a war between the Lord and the powers of darkness? And you know that Lord, that war was won when Christ died on the cross and arose the third day? Folks, the war has already been won. The problem is we don't see the war being won because demons are still active, Satan is still active. We can still see wickedness seemingly controlling this world. But there's coming a day, when will that be? When Christ comes back and when his wrath falls, that Christ's victory over these things will be brought out clearly. We will see clearly at that point in time, Christ is victor over all. So these horsemen and the army is a picture for us of the truth. This is all an issue of spiritual warfare. And when God's wrath falls at the second coming of Christ, it will be the final stage of that warfare. Christ has already gotten the victory, but it hasn't been publicly seen yet. It's when Christ comes back and God's wrath falls that his victory will be publicly declared to all. Because we'll see it before our eyes. The fire falling, consuming lost mankind and remaking this earth into a sinless new heavens and new earth. That's why I believe the horsemen are being shown. It relates the idea of an army to us and the fact that it's really a part of a big battle that's gone on from day one in the garden that Christ won at the cross but will be clearly manifest as being victor when he comes back. Okay, again, why 200 million? That's 200,000 times 1,000. Why is that? You know, there's a lot of different things you can do with numbers. Okay, and I certainly don't begin to, you know, teach that I'm a, I understand all there is to know about Bible numbers. It's an interesting study, and I've dabbled in it some. Normally, when I look at Bible numbers, I just look at the most basic, simple way to look at things. But I realize there's probably much more involved with the 200 million number than just what I'm going to present to you. Okay, so let me just say that. But here's what I could see in the 200 million. Okay, basically what you've got is this. In the number 200 million, you have basically 2 plus the number 1,000 and multiples of thousand. That's how you can get to 200 million. If you just take the numbers two and a thousand, which is all I'm going to look at, but again, I'm sure there's much more to it than this. When you look at the numbers two and a thousand, here's what you have. The idea of the number two is the idea of working together as a team or the idea of unity. It's the idea of being a witness for Christ. 
If you remember, when Christ sent his witnesses out, he sent them out two by two. The idea was each set of two would be working as a team, supporting one another, helping one another. And their role would be to declare the gospel of Christ. So two is the idea of unity. It's the idea of working together. It's the idea of being a member of the same team. In a sense, that type of idea. Well, the number 1,000 is very easy because throughout the Bible we see that the number 1,000 and its multiples, which the 200 million is a multiple of 1,000, 1,000 and all of its multiples are pictures of complete or totality. One example I'll give you, and this is a common example that we're all familiar with. In, I believe it's the book of Psalms, we're told, the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I believe it's Psalm 50 is where that's found, if I can remember right. The Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Does that mean that the Lord literally owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and when you get to hill number 1001, the Lord no longer owns the cattle? No. When the Bible says the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills, it's saying the Lord owns the cattle on all the hills. In other words, Lord owns all the cattle. Do you see where a thousand there is the idea of completion or totality? The Lord owns all the cattle. But it's pictured as owning them on a thousand hills because a thousand is such a great number. It's like you'll never get to an end of trying to count up a thousand hills. So in a sense, you're saying the Lord owns all the cattle. Okay. If, if we use those meanings for two and a thousand, here in this Revelation passage, here's what we got. You've got 200 million horsemen, which would teach us, number one, they are all working toward the same goals. They are all in opposition to the Lord. Again, it's a spiritual battle between the Lord and all the powers of darkness. Don't ever think that Satan is working toward one thing, but some of the other fallen angels are working toward something else. And the other powers of darkness, like lost mankind and their, their sinful flesh is working toward another goal. It's not so. Everything in the realm of spiritual darkness, meaning lost mankind, fallen angels, demons, Satan himself, the principalities and powers that the Bible talks about, the powers of darkness, all of them are working toward the same goal. They are all on the same team, supporting one another, helping one another, uh, seeking to accomplish all the same thing. And what is that? To take the honor and glory from Christ in any way possible. So they do all sorts of different things to try and take the honor and glory away from Christ. What he deserves. That's a whole other lesson to get into. But the point is this. Num the number two there would tell you this entire army is united. Okay, It's, it's all opposed to Christ. The thousand again is the idea of totality. The idea of being you know, fullness. The idea there is when God's wrath falls and when he defeats lost mankind, he's going to defeat Satan as well. He's going to defeat death. He's going to defeat sin. They've already, again, I say they've already been defeated when he died on the cross and rose again. But when his wrath falls at the final day, all of that will be clearly shown to men. And that defeat will actually be brought into realization in everybody's mind because you're going to see all of lost mankind fall. You're going to see Satan fall. All the powers of darkness will be defeated. That's why this whole army is the entire army. Everything the powers of darkness can throw against the Lord are going to be defeated when he comes back. Just like throughout history, all these powers of darkness were working toward opposing the Lord. When the Lord comes back, all these powers of darkness will be visibly seen to be defeated. Once again, so you don't misunderstand, I'll say one more time, when Christ died on the cross and rose again, that's when the defeat actually took place. But, when he comes back at the second coming, that's when the defeat will clearly be shown. So in that sense, that's when the defeat takes place. In the sense, it will be seen by everybody. That's when Satan will be destroyed. That's when the powers of darkness will be rendered helpless. That's when lost mankind will be judged for their sins. 
So even though all those things, in a sense, have already been secured by his death on the cross and his resurrection, they will actually take place in reality for people to see when he comes back. Okay. Listen to the description. And I saw the horses in the vision, and the sat on them, having breastplates of fire, okay? The, the horsemen, the ones riding the horse, I'll tell you, actually, they're not as important as the horse in this vision. Very little is said about the horsemen. The one thing we know about them is they're wearing breastplates of fire and jacinth and brimstone. Jacinth is a stone that can be either blue, yellow, or red in color normally. Folks, that's the color of flames. So what you have is fire, jacinth, and brimstone, which is sulfur that's burning. All of those are related to fire. They're all related to flames. You have these horsemen wearing these breastplates that are related to flame. Why? Because that's the judgment that's awaiting them. That's the final, ultimate defeat will be visibly manifest when fire does away with them. So it's like their destiny is being proclaimed by their breastplates. Their habitation is proclaimed by their breastplates. What's going to happen to them? They're going to be cast in the lake of fire forever. Now to the horses. The heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. Out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. There again you can see the relation between these demonic forces that have worked in the world that caused God's wrath to fall. It's related to fire again. Fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three were a third part of men killed by the fire, the smoke, the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. So again, you can see the idea there is <clears throat> these demonic forces are linked to fire because that's going to be their final end. That's how they're going to be defeated. The fire that falls at Christ's second coming and then being cast into the lake of fire for an eternity. We can see the idea they only killed a third part of men. What's that picture for us? Again, you got to keep in mind the whole idea of a third part here, just like in several of the other trumpet judgments, the point is this. As we're looking at the God's wrath falling in the trumpet judgments, this is not the, the uh, completed picture yet. There's more to come yet. So you have a third part of the men being killed, but you know what? There's men left yet. There still has more to come. By the time we get to the end of the vile judgments, you'll see nobody is left. Verse 19. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. Now get this. This is talking about the horse. Their power is in their mouth, and we saw that was fire, smoke, and brimstone coming out of their mouth, and in their tails. Okay, they're able to harm men with their tails as well. Their tails were like unto serpents. Man, when you read about a serpent, what do you think of? Satan in the Garden of Eden. Their tails were like serpents and had heads with whom they do hurt. It goes on. And the rest of the men were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and of wood. Alright. <clears throat> this is perhaps, I think, one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Now you've got to picture this. What John is seeing in this vision is this. You have these demonic army coming, afflicting their power upon men. Inflicting torture upon men, inflicting pain upon men, yes, even inflicting God's wrath upon men at the final day. It's all because of these demons. Okay? John sees that. In spite of all this pain and all of this suffering that is coming upon mankind due to these demonic armies, do you know what? The men still don't repent of their sin, even after going through all this. Can you imagine what, what that would be like for John to see this in a vision? What's this teach us about the condition of mankind? Folks, we have to remember something. Lost mankind is born with a fallen nature. 
because of that, naturally, because of their fallen nature, lost mankind is spiritually blind. They, now listen close, they cannot understand the things of the Lord. They cannot understand the truth of God's word. They cannot understand the gospel message. They cannot see their need to come to Christ apart from the Lord's intervention in their life. The only way that a lost person can ever come to a saving knowledge of Christ is by Christ intervening in their life, opening their blinded eyes to the truth, and drawing them to himself. Folks, let me tell you, when God's wrath falls, he's not going to be intervening in the life of anyone. The time of salvation for an individual is now, not after his second coming or at his second coming. That's a very sobering thought in two ways. For a lost person, listen, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, now is the time for you to search the Scriptures. Now is the time for you to come before the Lord, knowing that you cannot even see the truths of His Word without His intervention. Coming before Him, relying totally upon Him for your salvation. Submitting to Him. Begging him and asking him to please show you the truths of the word and bring you to a point where you'll be saved. Because you can't do it of your own effort. You can't do it of your own work. For a Christian, it's important for us to understand now is the time we need to take the gospel message to the lost. Why? When Christ comes back, it'll be too late. For anyone who is left who has not been saved, when Christ comes back, it will be too late for them to ever be saved. The Lord will no longer intervene in the lives of these individuals. You know, there's a, there is a teaching out there that, you know, well, during the Great Tribulation, there's going to be other people saved, yada, yada. This makes it plain right here. Listen, these lost men are facing demonic hordes, torments by those demonic hordes, and they still won't repent of their deeds. So we need to be careful and not give false hope to people, thinking, well... You know, I can still be saved after the Lord comes back. Absolutely not. The Bible doesn't say that any place. And here is a perfect verse that makes it plain. When, the, when God's wrath falls in the final days at the second coming of Christ, no one will see their need to be saved. Why? Because they will be spiritually blinded by their fallen nature. They'll be spiritually blinded by the demonic influence in their life. And Christ will no longer be intervening in the lives of men, showing them the truth and bringing them to himself. Finally, you notice it's interesting they give a list of sins that these men will not repent of. The first one has the idea of idol worship. <coughs> then it goes on. As, uh, then it goes on. Neither repented they of their murders, their sorceries, their fornication, or their thefts. If you take all five of those, the idea of idolatry, link that with murders, sorceries, fornication, and thefts. Pretty much those sins, those five sins and related sins. Like for example, let me give you just an idea of some of these. Okay, When it comes to murdering, that's obviously the sin of taking a person's life. But there's other sins related to murder. You've got anger, hatred violence. You know, those are other sins that many times are related to an act of murder. When you take these, all five of those, and you link them with other sins that are related to them, pretty much the best that I could think of, they cover every sin of mankind. Between idolatry, murders, fornication, sorceries, and thefts, and then again, in all the all the different sins that are related to those sins that many times are present when those sins are being committed, you have every sin that's possible for mankind to commit. What that's saying is, lost mankind, even when they're facing God's wrath, because of demonic intervention in their life, because of their fallen nature, and because the Lord will no longer be intervening in their lives, they won't even see the need to turn the world. They'll refuse to give up those sins for the sake of escaping the torment that they're facing. So folks, as we look at these, let's keep in mind 
as we look at these verses, let's keep in mind. The wrath that falls when Christ comes back, even though it's simply literal fire, it's got to be like a war. It's got to be, a matter of fact, the completion of a war that has gone on for the ages. Christ won that war on the cross when he resurrected from the tomb. But that his victory will be made clear, crystal clear to everyone when Christ comes back. If you want to see more about that war and Christ's victory at this point in time when he comes back, you can read Revelation 19. I believe it starts in verse 11 of Revelation 19. You have the same time period that this is talking about pictured there in Revelation 19, 11 through 21. It talks about a gigantic war that the Lord comes back and he gains the ultimate victory over the powers of darkness of this world. That's the basic principle of what we can learn from trumpet number 6. Lord willing, next time we'll begin Revelation chapter 10. May the Lord bless you as you study his word.